And if I was asked to ask you what a parable was, I'm sure quite most, most of you would know the, the, the answer to that. It's a simple answer. It's one that we've probably learned from school or Sunday school days up. That it's very simply put, and it is very simply put, that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In other words, it's an illustration taken from everyday life that was used, is used, to teach the truth about God, the truth about Jesus Christ, and the truth about the kingdom. This is the way that the Lord sought to teach us, to, to make it easier for us to, to understand the truth about him. And all parables have a central message. And in this particular case, we have it right there at the end, it's one of forgiveness. But I also believe that in coming to that central message, getting to the, what, as we move through the, 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 the parable here, this, the, the account that the Lord has given us of these two men, there are many other things and many other important lessons that we also can learn. We just can't focus in really on the one that has to be taken as a whole. And in tonight's reading this, this parable that we've read, the first thing that we notice here is and if you like the first character, and I use that term advisedly, that we, are, that, that we meet, that we are introduced to, is the king. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of a servant. So this king, he's calling his servants to give an account of themselves. That's what's going on here. That's what we've just read. That's very simple and very uh, easy to understand, and that we know that that happens. Uh, Men and women are asked to give account of themselves and their work and wherever else. That's what was going on here. But scripture also makes it very... So the king is seen as a type of God. You know, not a type of God, but is, is the Lord. That's what's going on here. And we know from scripture that every one of us will have to give an account of ourselves... To a holy God. Romans 14, 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. There is no exclusion here. We have to give account of ourselves to a holy God. Scripture confirms that fact. And just in case you're sitting thinking that the only ones that need to give account of themselves are Christians. Or alternative, you're sitting here thinking, well, the only ones that have to give account of themselves are the unregenerate, unregenerate the sinners on the day of judgment. But we cannot overlook the fact, and I would draw your attention to the wording of Romans 14, when it says, every knee... It also says every one of us shall give account. There are no exclusions. The difference comes in how we will stand before a holy God. Will we stand before him as one of his own to receive our reward? Or will we stand before him judged as a sinner, unrepentant, to be judged, to be cast into hell, to hear those dire words, Depart from me, you cursed, in the everlasting darkness, because I never knew you. That's the difference. It's how we stand before God that matters. And the time to make preparation for that is now. We cannot wait to, to, to we're walking into the room, if you like, so to speak, to meet the Lord. We wouldn't do that if we were, go, if we were summoned into the presence of King Charles. You'd be making preparations for weeks in advance how dare we think that we can be as off hand as that with, with a holy God we cannot, we dare not we must make preparation now aside from anything else we do not know the day or the hour that we will be ushered into the nearer presence of God to stand before him because no man knoweth the day or the hour that we will be called to give an account of himself we know those to be facts. And none of us will be stupid enough to say with a guarantee and a heart and a hand, I will definitely be here next week. Now, we will all say, I'll see you next week. That's just the way we talk. That's understood. 
But can we honestly guarantee our next breath? Only a fool would say yes. It is only by the grace of God and his mercy that we are here. That we have the opportunity to get ourselves right with him. We all must give an account. Now, in the parable, we've got the king's servants. And whether or not they were high-ranking officials, I'm not sure. There's certainly one of them would have been, the man that owed the greatest debt, would have been well up there, if you like. Whether or not they were men in the same sort of, you know, they were maybe a sort of a Joseph or a Daniel, just to use those for an example, they were, they were there, they, were, they worked for the, the, the king, if you like. But that's, that, that's what's going on here. And these servants in this parable, they must, they do represent us, that is man, mankind, men, women, boys, girls, young people, God's created. That's who are being represented by these two individuals. <clears throat> so we've got the king. Then with these, the, well, the, the first man comes along. And this, the first of the servants, he has, he's introduced to, to, to us and he has blotted his copybook big time. He has accrued or somehow he has managed, I suppose if you want to put it this way, one way or another, he has, he owes the king this huge amount of money. The, the modern term for it might be embezzled. He had helped himself to that which was not his own. And it was a huge amount of money. And we're going to see this, see just exactly the amount of money that it's been talked about here in a moment or two. But this was a massive debt. He could not, he, he he, he, was, he could not do anything about it. It was there. And there's an interesting parallel here, I think, with what was going on here and Belshazzar's feast. Um, in Daniel 5.27, we know what happened there. The, the Belshazzar brought out the, 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 um, the utensils from the temple and they were being uh, profaned by uh, being used in his feast. And all of a sudden, the fingers of a man's hand appeared in the wall and began to write, and the interpretation that was given by Daniel to the king was, Thou art wed in the balances, and thou art found wanting. Well, that's exactly what had happened to this man. He was wed in the balances, and he had been found wanting. He was wanting. There was a great imbalance in what there should have been and what there actually was. A massive amount. And it tells us there that the debt that was owed was 10,000 talents. Now that doesn't mean an awful lot to any of us today. What's 10,000 talents? Well, let's try and uh, understand what that was. And it is worth spending a bit of time in this because it will fully help us to fully realize the depths of this man's dilemma. And the importance of this we'll see later on. Now we can't merely think that 10,000 talents is 10,000 pounds. In other words, pound, you know, a talent equals a pound. Not like that. It wasn't that. Because if we do that, then we miss the point entirely. Now, let's be honest. Today, 10,000 pounds really isn't a vast amount of money. Now, if somebody gives me 10,000 quid on the way out, I won't be rude and say no. Right? So, don't be worried about that if you feel the need. But... The point of me, like, I was sitting, I was reading this before I came out of the house, and I was thinking about this. Like, 10 grand's a fair whack of money, but really, it's not a lot of money in today's context, if you like. I can remember going with my dad to buy the new family car. <laughs> and we went to Notragone in Belfast, and we came away, and it was a Humber Super Snipe estate. It was white with a blue stripe down the side of it. I mine it as well. You know what my dad paid for it? 30 quid. 
that was the, the car. So that was a fair amount of money when that was happening. So I'm saying 10 grand might be a lot, but it's not really, if you know what I mean. Right? So that's why I'm saying here, we can't just say a talent was a pound. So let's try and get a grasp of this, what this first character owed. In the New Testament, a talent was not a measured weight as it had been in the Old Testament. You know, you'll, you'll read about talents in the Old Testament. They were a measured weight. But a talent here in the New Testament, it was a, cur a, a unit of Roman currency. One talent equaled 6,000 denarii, or a penny, as the, the authorised version translates it. And this man owed 10,000 talents. Now, to my calculations, and my maths is terrible, so... But I reckon that's about 60 million denarii. That's what that man owed. So what does all that mean? Is that making it worse to understand? Maybe. But hopefully this will clarify it. That's a big amount. But again, let's put that into context. In Matthew 20 verse 2, we find out that a day's wages for a laborer, for a working man, was one penny, one denarius. Now at that rate of pay, it would take, it would have taken that man 16 and a half years to pay off just one talent at a day's wage per day to pay that off. One talent, 16 and a half years, and that bloke owed 60 million. That's the level of debt that we're talking about here. It's astronomical. It's unpayable. And I don't know what your, the, the modern equivalent for us to try and get lost in all the, the big figures and stuff like that there. But what happens, if, you know, 60 million, well, you hear millions talked about all that. Well, what have you owed 60 billion? Are we getting sort of close to it to try and to understand? So we give that, given that, it's hardly surprising that the king was more than a little displeased with him. And the man standing before him was a man in authority. He was one that was trusted. He may, like Joseph or Daniel, had the king's ear. He's, there's no doubt he was an authority to, to have access, even have access to that sort of money. A man charged in some way or other with overseeing the kingdom, but a man who had abused the trust that the king had placed in him. So the king was understandably and quite rightly livid and commanded that the servant and his family were sold in order to make recompense. Again, whether selling the man, his wife and his family would get him all the money back, I don't know, but it, must have, it would have offset it somewhat. But notice here that this man, this individual, this servant's misconduct affected not only himself, but also his family. Now that's vital because what we do, we do not, none of us live in a vacuum. And what we do as brothers and sisters in Christ, either at home or in the church or wherever else we are and work, it affects those around and about us. It affects those around and about us. And whether or not this man's family had any knowledge of what he was doing, I don't know. We're not told that. But whether or not they did or they didn't, and I'm not, I would, perhaps they did, I don't know. But they all suffered the consequences of this individual's actions. There were consequences for this man's actions. And again, we know that to be truth, even from our own lives. How often have you said, well, you know, the only one I'm doing any harm to is myself. I guarantee you, we've all said that at some point or another. Well, that just is not the case. There's not on, there's fallout from our actions. In the Old Testament, very well known again, we, we, we read about this man called Achan. We read about him in Joshua chapter 7. And we all know the background of that story, but very briefly, God had told the Israelites not to take the spoils from Jericho when they, when they went in and they took that city. 
but Achan saw something that he liked and he took it for himself. He had silver, he had gold, and he had a suit of clothes, for want of a better expression. And as a result, the Isra Israel suffered because the next city that was, should have been a walkover resisted them and there were men lost their lives in that. But also Achan's family suffered and Achan suffered and if we go to Joshua 7, 24 and following, we learn of the fallout from this one man's disobedience. And it says there, And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the gold and the garment and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them onto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them <coughs> uh, with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Echor unto that day. Our actions have consequences. And if we try to be fly with a holy God, then there will be consequences. What happened to the servant here? Let me try and bring that into context. How often have you heard of a high-profile Christian that transgresses, that sins, and it's made public? Who suffers for that? he does, his family does, his church will, but who suffers most? The name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. That's why this stuff is taken so seriously. We look at that and say, oh well now you know, that, that's harsh. Why is wife? The Lord suffers and the Lord will not tolerate sin. Because that's what we're talking about here. The Lord will not tolerate sin. And brothers and sisters, and outside of Christ, wherever you're hearing us tonight, you need to understand that. We be flippant about sin. We giggle, we tee he about it. It's wink, wink, nudge, nudge stuff. But God takes sin seriously, and we should take it equally as seriously. We have been called on to holiness, to be separate from the world, to stand above the world, now, will we make mistakes? Will we trip up? Will we fall? Yes, but do we do it deliberately? No. This man was, Achan did it deliberately, to deliberately shake our fists at God and say, well, I'm all right. Sure, who's going to know? See, in the case of Achan, he had, a, he had the, the, the goods buried in his tent. In the case of this man, well, I don't know, he probably had them couple of offshore accounts if you want to use a modern way of understanding it and everything was being siphoned off into that where his own did not know about it but when the focus of attention came on it and let us understand this that a, we, we are never out of the spotlight of a holy God God is omnipresent he is everywhere he seeth all we need to remember that when we are going about this business but this servant, he clearly knew that his master was a, a just man. Because why else would he have sought mercy? And the thing about it, the king, in his mercy, granted it. And not only did he say, okay, you won't go to jail, we'll work some other payment plan out. You know, you pay it off 20 pound down and whatever for the rest of your life. He said, no, you're forgiven, the debt's wiped clean. That's what he did. That was the, 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 the justice, of the, the love that this man had to this servant. Is that not a type of God? Is that not an example of God's forgiveness towards us? Mercy was granted. Now, for some reason, I can't help but think that this servant was self-seeking because he was only wishing to save his own hide and avoid embarrassment. And I think that for a couple of reasons. Firstly, he makes abs the absolutely ludicrous promise if mercy were granted, he would repay the debt in full. How was he ever going to do that? Secondly, 
because his actions toward the third character in the, the parable, and we're going to speak about him in a minute or two, who owed him in comparison a very insignificant sum of money. But yet he had no time for the plea of mercy from that individual. He thought only of himself. So he thought of himself to, to, to avoid the debtor's prison, to, to avoid embarrassment for himself, to avoid embarrassment for his family. He would make this ludicrous promise, which didn't have to be carried out, but yet he thought only of his own self when it came to dealing with those around and about him. Is that not humanity? Is that not man? We want it all for ourselves, but yet we aren't prepared to bend for others. God has forgiven us so much. And yet, and yet, even in the church of Jesus Christ, there is a hardness exists. Do you know what is said? And I'm sure you've heard this, that the church of Jesus Christ is the only organization that shoots its own wounded. When our brother or sister trips and, and stumbles, what do we do? Do we demonstrate mercy as God has demonstrated mercy to us? Or do we put the boot in? What do we do? <clears throat> so we have two men here. And they both have something in common. Well, there are a couple of things in common. One was that they worked for the king. Worked for the, king. the other is this. They both had a debt that both could never repay. Regardless of the specific amounts... Repayment was beyond their capability. Now, this is a parable. And the debts spoken of here are a type of or a direct reference to sin. It's a direct reference to sin. And before we go on, we need to make an attempt to define sin. And that is not an easy thing. It is not an easy thing. If you lift a book from of, uh, a theological book off the shelf and you try to read about it, there's whole books been read on it. You look at the systematic theology and there are pages upon pages upon pages written about trying to define sin. So we're going to keep it simple. Have to keep it simple. Now, I want you to bear with me in this, please. I do not want anybody hearing half of what I'm going to say and then walking out of here and saying, this is what Roy Stevenson said, he's nothing but a heretic. Please, bear with me in this. Sin is not, now, what sin is, here's what sin isn't, or as far as I can see anyway. Sin is not smoking, drinking, doing drugs, theft, adultery, murder, etc., etc. Those things are undoubtedly sinful. Let me make that quite clear. And they come about as a result of sin. So what is sin? Sin, and it's most simple, and it's simply defined as rebellion against God. That's what sin is, a rebellion against God. These things, these other things, are a manifestation of that rebellion. We are all born in sin. We know that. And these things that I've mentioned, they come as a result of that rebellion. Now, if we go right back to Genesis, as we have to, we read that Adam was created in the image of God. Genesis 1.26, and God said, let, the, let us make a man in our image. There's the plural, the, the, the trinity there at creation. Let us make a man in our image after our likeness. In other words, a perfect man, a perfect being. Not necessarily, not physically the same, not physically the same, but in all other ways, perfect, without sin. And in verse uh, 27 of Genesis 1, we're told, God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So Adam and Eve were perfect. They were sinless beings. Adam was originally the same as God in this respect. But when we move on, and after the fall, the point at which Adam yielded to temptation, we read that rather than Adam's offspring being in God's image, perfect, they were like Adam, that is, sinners. 
Genesis 5, 3. And Adam begat a son in his own likeness after his image. So because Adam was the father, is the father of all living things, they, we, we, men and women, have inherited, have acquired that family attribute that is to be found in everyone that is born of a woman. And there is one notable exception to that, of course, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though born of a woman, was conceived supernaturally by the, the Holy Ghost. And like the debts, which are a type of sin in this parable, the two characters in our reading tonight, our sin debt, what we owe, what we owe God, is one that can never be dealt with ourselves. Now, we've discussed this before. We cannot work our way to heaven. It is not a merit demerit system. Only God, only Jesus Christ can forgive the, 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 the sin debt that we owe. God, the king, only he can do it. That's a fact. Because it is, it is against the holy God that we rebel. Only God can deal with sin. And just like the king in the parable tonight, God demonstrates his love towards us, undeserved and an inexplicable love. He demonstrates that towards us. If we call upon him, if we earnestly seek his mercy, we will obtain forgiveness. There is no doubt about that. There can be no question about that. God's word is oozing with that very thing. In both Old and New Testaments, God longs to forgive men and women of their waywardness, of their sinfulness. God does not take any joy at all in punishing his creation. He wants us to walk after him. He wants us to walk in the way that he has set for us to not rebel. And that's grace. That's grace. God's undeserved favor towards man. That's grace. God's willingness to forgive. For grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. I want to say something here regarding our attitude towards God's mercy. Now it seems to me that far too many of God's people place much more important upon, importance upon the external stuff that a man or a woman is forgiven rather than what has been forgiven. And what I mean is um, listen, we dare not do that. And we often hear people, you know, come along to the meeting tonight, so-and-so's coming to give us testimony, and it's a great testimony. Now, what we generally mean, or at least in my experience, and I will qualify it for that, when we say that somebody has a great testimony, we mean that they've been a great a reprobate before they have known the Lord, they have lived a profligate life far from God, far into the world, steeped in all the vices that you can think of. And those people, and it's great that they're, look, I'm not trying to diminish what the Lord has done, and I'm saying this is the way we with our human minds think. We exalt those people that their testimony is somehow better or greater than the man or the woman who at no age at all yielded their life to the Lord and lived their entire life serving God. And we look and we think, well, there's a difference there. No, there's not. 
because it's not the actions necessarily that have been forgiven. It's the cause that's been forgiven. And as we've seen here, the, the cause, the debt, is equally large. It is equally large. You know, the best couple of... Now, look, I, I, I am not diminishing the fact that men and women are taken out of a great deal. And it's wonderful when you hear people talking like that. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. But I'm telling you that the best testimonies I've heard recently began like this. I was a sinner. I'm saying no more about it. Here's what the Lord's done for me. There was far too many testimonies emphasized what they were like before the Lord saved us. And then, well, you know, the Lord saved me from grace as that. Amen. No. No. Life starts when we get saved, folks. Isn't that right, brothers and sisters? Life starts when we get saved. And we need to get hold of that. It's the forgiveness of sin. The debt of sin that we owed. We are all born in sin. It is our natural state. The only thing that differs is the degree to which it manifests itself in our lives. But only, only Christ can cancel this debt. And that is something so hard for people to get their heads round that sin is sin is sin. Northern Ireland is full of good living people, isn't it? Yeah. And it's very hard if you're brought up in the church and you live a clean life. It's very hard for you to accept that you are a sinner. And that the eyes of a holy God, your sin's every bit as bad as Joe Bloggs standing down the street dealing drugs. And we can't get our heads around that. But it is never the less the case. Who dares among us place more or less importance on a soul? Or for that matter, more or less importance on the degrees of sinfulness? We don't look at people and say, well, you know, that boy there is worthy of all that God has given or will do for him. Whilst that boy there, nah. No. I guarantee you, and I'm going to speak for myself now, I guarantee you that before I get saved, in Sunday's view, Guarantee it that there'd be people in the church looked at me and went, No. 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 For God so loved the world. God does not. God looks down and he sees two, and it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, by the way. Your eyes are too close together, they're too far apart, you've picked the wrong spot, you sit in the wrong side of the street, you're skin colors too, whatever. Look, folks, God looks down and he sees none of that. He sees two types of people. Sheep of the goat, the lost, the saved. That's it. Now we have holy eyes to look out over cool rain. Northern Ireland Both of the men in this parable carried a debt, an amount that neither can pay. And they both knew it. See that other man, he owed a hundred pence. It wasn't a pound. It wasn't a pound. It was three or four months wages to that man. But it was something he couldn't pay. But it was only when these men were webbing the balance that they acknowledged what they owed. And so it is here tonight. Christ is standing before us all. And we are being called in our own hearts to give an account of ourselves. We are being wed in the balance. 
And will we be found wanting? And to answer that, the answer to that question is truly only known to two people. One's God and the other one's yourself. And it is with Christ the King with whom you must deal directly. Now, the debt was exposed in this parable. And there will be people that will get through their entire life and will keep their debt secret. And they'll take it to the grave. And they think they've got away with it. And those around about, if it, if it comes to, to, to light at a later time after their demise, they'll say, well, he got away with that. He might get away with it. You might get away with it in this same time. I might get away with it in this same time. But we won't get away with it when we stand before our judge. And the time to put things right is now. And the way we put things right is to ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> if you're weighed in the balance, will you be found wanting? Only you and the Lord know the answer to that. And it is from him that you must seek mercy. And it is only him that from him that mercy can be granted. But folks, a word of warning. Don't come with a self-seeking attitude the way that first man did. Look at what happened to the king's servant. He thought he'd got away with it. He, he had, he, well, he, not that he got away with it. He, was, he pled to the la his master. He was forgiven. The debt was, was wiped out. And then he went and he did what he shouldn't have done. And the king got him and he said, right, boy, You've been handed over to the tormentors. He was delivered to the tormentors until he would pay the debt. And as we have seen, he probably couldn't, well, he never would have repaid it. It was massive. And so it is with you. What will you do tonight? Will you earnestly seek forgiveness from the king of kings tonight? Or will you go out with your burden of debt? your burden of sin. John Bunyan and that, 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 that pilgrim's progress, the, the, the central character there, pilgrim, comes, uh, he had this great burden that he carried about everywhere. And every day this burden grew larger and larger and larger and it weighed him down. And it was only when he came to the cross and he sought Christ that that burden fell off. And so it is with the debt of sin, the burden of sin that we all carry and that we have all, before we meet Christ, it will weigh us down. And only the Lord Jesus can deal with that. And without him, without seeking his forgiveness, without coming to him, you continue to carry the sin, the sin debt. You will continue to do that. And only when you call upon Christ, only when you call upon Christ, will that be taken and removed from you. And if you fail to call on Christ, if you fail to call or you turn away, you will face the tormentors. Scripture has given us that truth. You will face the tormentors. You will never ever be able to pay the debt of sin that you owe. If you don't believe me about what happens at the end of a Christless life, read Luke 16. And it tells us there that the rich man being in torments in hell. That's the, 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 the most graphic description in scripture of what happens to the one who dies without Christ. Cast in to everlasting torment in hell. And that is the word of God. That is not me making anything up. One last thought as we close. If you owed, for the sake of argument, one million pound and someone offered to take your debt, pay it for you and never get to bring it to your remembrance, I would say you would jump at the opportunity. You would. You'd bite their arm off. 
Well, if you had any sense, you would. Not to be flippant. Not to lessen anything that Christ has done by looking at and considering it in this way. But the Lord Jesus Christ has offered to pay a debt for you that you can never pay. The thing that chorus, he, what he paid a debt, I owed a debt I could not pay, he paid a debt he did not owe. And that is a scriptural truth. That's exactly what the Lord done. And he is offering that to you now. The forgiveness of this debt if you only come to him. And that's the struggle that people have. They want the debt forgiven. Like this other bloke, the, the first man in their parable. But they want to then go on like they, they always have. They, they, they don't realize that in surrendering to Christ, they're to do just that. They are to surrender. We are to surrender. The offer of forgiveness is before us. Is before you tonight. And if you are outside of Christ, that offer stands for you. And it is there. And the, the biggest struggle that anybody has, you know, to get our heads around it. And it's, it's why do people not come? And look, I know when I said that, that for years I wouldn't. I didn't. I refused. And I guarantee you that you... In here with testimonies, will even testify to the same in your own life. You felt convicted, you, you put it back, you put it off, you put it off, you put it off. And it's the most obvious thing. But because of sin, because of our reluctance to surrender, what we see as being fun, we reject Christ. And at some point, we will go and we will stand in the literal presence of a holy God and we will give account of ourselves. Friends, the offer stands. Call upon him while he may be found. And your debt, your sin debt, will be forgiven. And remember, he is the only one that can do that. Amen and amen.